Coming up. Let me be clear, President Trump is a believer, and so am I. Part two of our exclusive interview with Vice President Mike Pence. Then. He goes, are you going to let her do that to you? A teenage dare turns deadly. And I noticed the headlights of a truck coming up the hill. The initial shock. I knew at that point he never made it. And the unrelenting guilt. I don't need to be here anymore. How a message from beyond the grave finally sets him free. With forgiveness from Jesus, that's all you need. On today's 700 Club. Hey, it's another week, and welcome to the 700 Club. We're delighted to have you with us. We've got some good things for you today. You don't want to miss any of it. Hey, it looks like Congress is, is on track to give America the big Christmas present that President Trump promised. It's a major tax cut. It's the first major overhaul of the tax code in decades. And now members from the House and Senate will begin working together on a joint committee so they can send a bill to the president for him to sign by the end of the year. It's a big, big deal. Merry Christmas to all of us. Merry right? Christmas, we hope. <laughs> well, right. at the same time, Special Counsel Robert Mueller is moving ahead with his investigation into Trump's presidential campaign. But Mueller's team faced an embarrassing revelation this weekend as well. Jenna Browder brings us the story from Washington. It's not clear where the special counsel investigation is going. The White House and some Republicans downplaying former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn's guilty plea for lying to the FBI about his conversations with Russia. That plea agreement does not, to me, indicate that there's, there's very much else there. Some critics are calling all of this politically motivated, and the president pointed to anti-Trump text messages sent by one FBI official on the special counsel's team. Robert Mueller removed him from the position, but Trump said the FBI's credibility is, quote, in tatters. Despite the criticism, Democrats have a different view. I think what we're beginning to see is the putting together of a case of obstruction of justice. Senator Dianne Feinstein telling Meet the Press the obstruction evidence is coming partly from the president's tweets about fired FBI director James Comey. Trump tweeting over the weekend, I never asked Comey to stop investigating Flynn. Critics say that tweet goes against Comey's sworn testimony that Trump asked him to ease up on his investigation into Flynn. I understood him to be saying that what he wanted me to do was drop any investigation connected to Flynn's account of his conversations with the Russians. But Trump's personal attorney, John Dowd, says he actually wrote the tweet, not the president, and that he wrote it wrong. And on Capitol Hill, all eyes are on a different subject, tax reform. Now that the Senate and House have both passed their tax measures, it's now a matter of working out their differences and agreeing on one final bill. Republicans are confident they can make it happen, and Trump has suggested he might settle for a higher business tax rate, 22 percent instead of 20 percent. The president seems to be unconcerned about the special counsel investigation. At the same time, he appears to be on the verge of his biggest legislative accomplishment to date, one that could have major implications for the economy. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. Well, our new CBN News political co correspondent David Brody is with us now. David, there was an FBI agent who apparently uh, was having an affair with a fellow FBI lady, and uh, he was tweeting some rather uh, nasty things about the president. They fired him, and he was on the Mueller team. Could you tell us what you know about that? Well, there are those anti-Trump texts, uh, as Jenna just pointed out there, but they, it even goes beyond that, Pat. If you go back a few months ago, look, uh, when Robert Mueller br brought in his team, many of them were either donating to the Democratic Party, they were donors potentially to Hillary Clinton's campaign, not campaign, but at, at times having some ties to Hillary Clinton. And also those lawyers sometimes worked on certain projects involving Hillary Clinton. So you put all of that together and Donald Trump comes out on Twitter and called it months ago a witch hunt. And 
indeed he is sticking by that. And then, of course, we know about this ABC News report, this false report that Brian Ross, their uh, investigative reporter, was suspended for. You put all of that together and, you know, here goes Donald Trump basically saying to his base, that deplorable base, that this thing has been a witch hunt from the very beginning. It's been a setup. We'll see. Bottom line here, no smoking gun as of this point, Pat, and I think that's the key right now. Well, what, what about this Flynn? Uh, uh, well, he pled guilty to lying, but lying about what? And so people are saying that it doesn't look like there's any collusion with any Russian involved in the Flint uh, prosecution. Uh, I guess you call it a prosecution. Well, right. I mean, lying basically that he did meet with the ambassador, uh, the Ru a Russian ambassador. But look, I mean, after that, what do they have exactly? And, and I think the question then becomes, how much is the White House concerned about what Flynn is going to tell uh, Mueller's team? There's been no sense at all, at least uh, from my White House reporting and White House sources, that they believe Flynn has any of these, quote, goods to deliver uh, to Mueller whatsoever, especially indicting the president of the United States. So, so we'll see about that. But at this point, there doesn't appear to be anything that Flynn has that would be that smoking gun, Pat. All right, well, let's go to taxes, which is the big deal for all of us. Uh, are the Republicans expecting any problems as they come, come to that conference committee? Well, leave it to the Republican Party to kind of uh, figure this out and maybe not necessarily come to some sort of agreement at the end. Bottom line is they will. They'll get it done. I, I, the House and Senate sources that I'm talking to I believe this is a fait accompli, that it'll happen, no doubt about it. However, that corporate tax rate we've heard about uh, could indeed jump to 22 percent rather than 20 percent that Donald Trump wanted. And that's because there's a lot of reasons for that. But they want to probably add a few more tax breaks back into the bill. And the way to do that is obviously increase the revenue. And the way you increase the revenue is you raise the, raise the corporate tax rate. So that could be one thing. Also, Pat, we're, we're going to be watching is the Johnson Amendment. We've heard all about the Johnson Amendment. We've done a lot of reporting on it here on the 700 Club. It is in the House bill. It is not in the Senate bill. Uh, just talking to a Senate source saying it's a 50-50 shot at this point, whether or not the Johnson Amendment, which in essence would allow churches and other nonprofits to speak boldly from the pulpit, as we've talked about, uh, and, not, and not, get, uh, not have a problem from the IRS. Right now, that language is 50-50 at best to get in the final bill. All right. Well, uh, it, it looks like uh, uh, that's what you're talking about. And um, so uh, there's no real contentious point in, in, in the conference that you can see. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Well, there's a couple of things. Contentious, you know, it's all relative at this point, Pat, because honestly, this bill most likely is going to pass. I mean, there's nothing major in there. A tinkering with the corporate tax rate, possibly. Also remember, the House bill actually starts the corporate tax rate at 20 percent this year or in 2018. The Senate bill starts that corporate tax rate uh, when it dips from 35 to 20 percent. It starts in 2019, a year later. So they're going to have to figure that part of it out. But beyond that, no, I think pretty much... Uh, this is what it is. There is the individual uh, mandate we've heard about, the Obamacare individual mandate. Uh, that is in the Senate bill, not in the House bill. Unclear at this point whether or not that will survive. So that'll be a point of contention, too. Well, it looks like to me if they they want to get the maximum impact, they need to start those tax cuts right now. Of course, if they let it go for a year or two, it's not going to have near the same impact that it would if they brought it in right now. Is, is that... Do you think they'll do that? Well, that's a great point that you make, Pat, because I can tell you that about nine months ago or so, when we were having this tax reform discussion, actually, it was Obamacare, but we were also talking about tax reform, excuse me, tax reform. Uh, some, of the, some of my House and Senate colleagues, or colleagues, <laughs> sources, listen to me, uh, sources were telling me that if they don't get these tax cuts done by November at the very latest, Thanksgiving, you're not going to have enough time to get this thing moving uh, in time for the midterm elections and really get that economic mojo, if you will, uh, humming along. So uh, I think there's a concern that if this is delayed any further, you won't see much of, of an effect from this, this tax reform package by the midterms. Having said that, uh, the economy is humming along pretty well as we speak, so, so we'll see. All right, one last question. Uh, the president came out very strongly for Roy Moore, and uh, he talked down the opponent and said how much he needs that extra vote in the Senate. What do you think about that uh, Alabama race? 
Well, the polls are all over the place. Uh, we see Doug Jones's opponent up by three points. Another poll has Roy Moore up by six points. And, and you know, ultimately, I don't think any of these polls are going to matter. I think there is this silent effect down in Alabama, as you don't want to tell the pollsters exactly what you think because it's been such a toxic issue down there. I think ultimately Roy Moore will probably pull it out uh, based on the terrain in Alabama and based on the fact that this is, I don't want to say die down a little bit, but let's face it, after two, three, four weeks of this, uh, relatively speaking, it's died down, and we know the big Israel news on the embassy is coming this week. Uh, and so you put that, and you put Flynn, and you put everything else that in Trump world, it's like a roller coaster out there, Pat. Uh, the Roy Moore situation may settle down, and that, that should benefit Roy Moore. Well, David, thank you. And we look forward to uh, having your second part of your interview with the vice president, which I think will be very interesting. Terry. Thanks, Pat. Well, up next, Vice President Pence talks about his personal faith and the president's. Let me be clear, President Trump is a believer, and so am I. And we understand uh, the role of faith in the life of this nation. Stay tuned for our CBN News exclusive interview with the vice president after this. Well, welcome to a new week and some exciting things going on. The, the Senate passed the tax cut bill that goes to conference. The next few uh, days will be uh, intense negotiations between the House and the Senate conferees. But as far as we can tell, survival is at stake, and they all know it, and they know they've got to pass the tax reform. And it could be a very good thing, not only for the economy, but for you personally. So we'll be following that right along. But uh, right now, we want to show you the second half of David Brody's interview with the vice president, who said, quote, President Trump is a believer, and so am I. And they are the words of Vice President Mike Pence in that exclusive interview with CBN's David Brody. They talked about the president's faith, newfound uh, access for evangelicals in the White House, and the vice president's prediction for the year ahead. Here's part two of that interview from the Naval Observatory Library. President Trump often describes the importance of having Mike Pence as vice president. Yes, he knows how Washington works and plays a key role with Congress, but there's more. That's why evangelicals are just as happy to have this strong Christian in the number two slot. Pence helps make sure they have a voice inside the White House. Evangelicals, uh, we like to call it, boy, in the evangelical world, they're sure getting some access here, you know, whether it be, you know, the, the pro-life groups or the evangelical, you know, policy groups, all of that. But beyond that, cabinet Bible studies, praying in the Oval Office, evangelicals around the country are going, wow, it seems like a new day in Washington. What is going on, as we would say spiritually, at the White House? Well, I think President Trump has a, a heart of gratitude uh, for evangelical Christians in this country. I have to tell you, the sweetest words the president and I ever hear, and we hear them a lot, are when people grab us by the hand and say, we're praying for you. Uh, I've, I've been with this president in the Oval Office with, with religious leaders when, when people have asked to pause for a moment of prayer, and the president readily embraces that. I think he's always very humbled and grateful by the support of believers. But let me be clear, President Trump is a believer. And so am I. And we understand uh, the role of faith in the life of this nation. And the American people, I think, can be encouraged to know that in President Donald Trump, uh, uh, they have a leader who um, embraces and respects and appreciates uh, the role of faith and the importance of religion in the lives of our families and our communities and our nation. And he always will. Since taking their oaths in January, both men have worked to establish a stronger economy and defense while facing a stubborn Congress and an ongoing Russia investigation. Pence gave us his take on the year in review. What's been the highlight for you this year, whether it be legislatively or other, and what's been maybe 
one of the more challenging moments of the year. Uh, some would say, it'll, uh, call it a low light, you may call it a more challenging moment. What would that be? Well, I think the high point for me has been to serve as vice president to a president who's focused so much on the safety and security of the American people. Uh, president Trump has uh, already signed uh, the largest increase in military spending in a decade and before the end of this year, we believe we'll make the largest investment uh, in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan. With that renewed commitment, our armed forces are making extraordinary progress uh, in the fight against radical Islamic terrorism. Uh, uh, ISIS is on the run. Uh, literally, uh, the American armed forces and our allies have overtaken uh, what, what just a few short years ago, uh, ISIS declared to be their capital of their so-called new caliphate in Raqqa. Uh, but uh, to see the way this president uh, has provided leadership uh, as our commander in chief, his, his strong and swift decision uh, to use American military power to respond to the use uh, of, of chemical weapons against innocent civilians in Syria, I think it sent a message to the world uh, that America is back, uh, that America has, uh, in a very real sense under President Trump, We've restored the credibility of American leadership. And as I've traveled around the world, I've, I've heard it again and again uh, that, that, uh, that, that leaders, whether it was when, when I traveled in Europe or the Asia Pacific or in South America, are grateful uh, to see a president, to see an administration that's embracing our role as leader of the free world and providing uh, our military with the focus on the mission of, of defeating ISIS and, and uh, for me, that progress uh, is, uh, is, is uh, 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 the proudest accomplishment uh, that, uh, uh, of this administration during the year 2017. And challenging moment of the year? What's, what's been challenging for you? Well, obviously, the, the extraordinary impact of, of the hurricane season on Florida and, and Texas and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, and then the, the tragedies that we've seen in mass shootings. Uh, in, in Las Vegas and, and in that small town in Texas. I, I know that it's, uh, it, it has uh, been a real burden on the heart of our president uh, and, and our family. But, but I must tell you that um, in, in the same breath, I would say, David, how proud we are uh, of our first responders in the wake of those hurricanes, how proud we are of the job that FEMA has done at, at every level uh, to, to come alongside families in, in, uh, in, those, in those moments and uh, help families rebuild. And, and President Trump has brought that uh, optimism and that determination to tell people, we're with you today, we'll be with you tomorrow, and, and as we're proving every day, that we're going to be with these communities every day as they rebuild. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but th th those are the events, those are the events that are, uh, that are, that are heavy on the heart of those of us that have the privilege to serve. So what's in store for 2018? While the economy hums along, Pence paints an even rosier outlook. Any New Year's resolutions, by the way? When this tax cut makes its way to the president's desk, we believe we'll have laid a foundation by rolling back red tape, by appointing strong conservatives to our courts at every level, including Justice Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. That combined with tax relief, we believe is gonna lay a foundation for sustained economic growth, the likes of which we've begun to see in this country already. Uh, and what President Trump wants to do with that in the next year uh, is, is to follow on with that, to rebuild America through an infrastructure plan, to reform welfare, to move people even more from welfare to work in a growing economy, to confront the, the opiate crisis that is besetting so many American families. There's great, great work to do. Um, and uh, I know that when we roll our sleeves up on January 1st and go to work in 2018, the president will stay just as focused on the mission that he was elected to advance, to make America safe again, to make America prosperous again, and to borrow a phrase, to make America great again. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Well, you can see the entire interview with Vice President Pence, including a discussion about moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. That's on CBNNews.com. And you can hear David talk about how he finally got his interview on our new 
CBN News Daily Rundown podcast with Caitlin Burke. Terry. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, coming up, a teenage dare turns deadly. I remember Josh looking at me and goes, are you going to let her do that to you? I got alongside of her and I looked over and I noticed out of the corner of my eye the headlights of the truck coming up the hill. See what happens next when we come back. Schwab and his best friend Josh were inseparable until the day Eric took Josh up on a dare behind the wheel of a car. Eric Schwab was 17 when he was arrested for the death of his best friend, Josh. You know, I blame myself for everything. And I just, I would have done anything to make it right. The two were always hanging out. They especially liked playing together on their high school basketball team. Josh was extremely gifted. He was much better than I was, uh, but he always pushed me. And he was just a, a fun-loving guy. He, he didn't care what people thought about him. On a Friday night in September 1998, Eric was giving Josh a ride home when a girl they knew passed them on a two-lane road. I remember Josh looking at me and goes, are you gonna let her do that to you? I got alongside of her and I looked over and I noticed out of the corner of my eye the headlights of a truck coming up the hill. I looked over at Josh and I said, are you okay? And he looks at me and goes, yeah, I'm going to be fine. The next thing I know, I woke up in the ambulance. And at that point is when I started to pray, which I've never done before. Eric was taken to the hospital with a concussion and a number of cuts and bruises. Eric asked his nurse about Josh. She had tears in her eyes. I knew at that point he never made it. And I blamed God from probably maybe an hour and a half after the accident. Why me? Why now? You're supposed to be there to protect us. Eric also blamed himself and couldn't understand how anyone could forgive him. The first people to the hospital were his mom and his grandma. They came in there and they were crying. They've already forgiven me. I didn't know what that meant at that point. Days later, they buried his friend. Eric was arrested for negligent homicide. Released to his parents, he spent the next eight months in and out of court. During one appearance, his friend's mother read a letter to the court on Eric's behalf. And in my mind, I'm thinking, why are you doing this? I don't deserve this. I deserve to go to jail. Eric was only given four years probation with community service, but memories of Josh dominated his thoughts. I went to drinking. I went to smoking marijuana just to forget about all of it. I remember sitting there with one of my stepdad's guns and just sat there and thought about all the people I hurt, the problems I've caused, the path I was on, the drinking, the drugs. For what? I don't need to be here anymore. I just never could do it. Over the next 16 years, Eric continued to struggle with guilt and depression. The drugs and alcohol didn't fill the void left by his friend. On occasion, he would visit Josh's grave. But on a graveside visit in October 2014, Eric's thoughts turned elsewhere. I just sat there and just started praying and just asking God to if there's anything left for me to do here on this earth, just point me in the right direction. Eric started reading the Bible and going to church. As he did, he discovered an important truth. I found out that there was people in the Bible that weren't perfect, you know, that did bad things. And Jesus forgave them. 
Eric asked for and accepted God's forgiveness. It was just such a surreal moment of just, I gave it all up, everything. And when I truly repented and I gave up everything, the drinking, the drugs, it was gone. I know what that void is. The void was Jesus. The void was Christ. He also felt the weight of Josh's death was finally lifted. There was a, a sense of hope. Others have forgiven me for what I've done already that I didn't know. Everything changed. The way I thought, the way I felt, the way I started to see things, just clear. In 2015, Eric married Michelle, and today they have a beautiful daughter. He's thankful for the freedom of forgiveness he now has through Jesus Christ. It's a feeling of just peace to know that he's our savior and to wake up every morning with forgiveness from Jesus and thank him every day for that forgiveness. That's all you need. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, Eric said that at the moment that he was in that car and woke up and got into that ambulance, he started to pray something he hadn't done before. But then, so often we do what Eric did. Right afterwards, he's blaming God. Why weren't you there? You're supposed to take care of us. You know, we presume on God so incredibly. We don't have space for him. We don't have time for him. We don't need him until we're in an out-of-control situation. And then we cry out almost with anger, God, where are you? And yet, in the midst of our presumption, God is there. And he sits and he waits and he loves and he forgives and he has mercy. Have you presumed on God in your life? Are you going to wait until the moment you're, you're in an ambulance or some other crisis situation and then cry out to God that he should be there for you in the midst of your pain and your hurt and your loss? Listen, he's there right now. The question isn't, where is God? The question is, where are you? Why, why would you... Walk away from your inheritance. The Bible says he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. That's an intense thought. Where are you? He's always been there. He also talked about the fact that when his friend's family forgave him, he didn't deserve it. You know, that's true for every one of us. Even right now, when you're not tuned into God, when you're not making him a part of your life, giving him any of your life, he stands there not just standing, but with forgiveness in his hand, saying, I died for you. I paid the price for your mistakes, for who you are, for the lostness in you. You see, that's where we all are without Jesus. We're all lost. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. There is no one who gets out of that. But everyone is invited to be forgiven. So today, you can stay a victim of your circumstance. You can be indifferent to God. You can even be calloused about what you think about him. But his forgiveness is open to you. And I believe that if you'll receive that today, you'll experience exactly what Eric did. The emptiness inside, that thing that you're filling with all the junk and all the wrong decisions is going to finally rest, finally find peace, finally find what it is you've been looking for all along. How do you get there? Listen, you lay it all down. You lay it all down. You say, Jesus, I get it. I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and I get that you died for me, not just generically for mankind. You died for me, and I'm asking you today to forgive my sins and then tell him what they are. Name them one by one. If you're like me, you'll have a long list. The length of the list isn't what he cares about. It's the openness of your heart to receive the sacrifice he made for you because of the love he wants to give to you. Ask him to come into your heart and life and then ask him to change you because Jesus loves you right where you're at, but he loves you too much to let you stay there. Forgiveness is what opens the door to new life and new beginnings. So forgive yourself 
And then in, get into the Word of God. You know, find out what He has to say to you. He's got a wonderful, wonderful plan for your life. Don't miss out on that. If you'd like information on what it means to walk with Jesus, to be his follower, to be his friend, to be forgiven by him, a new day is our gift to you. Pat's put this together with you in mind, filled with information. It's free. You get it by calling our toll-free number, which is 1-800-700-7000. If you're struggling with forgiveness, ask for the forgiveness pamphlet. We'll send them both to you. There's a friend standing by to take your call. So call now, 1-800-700-7000. Pat? Thanks, Terry. Well, still ahead, we've got your email questions. Joy said, quote, I did the salvation prayer. I invited God into my heart, but nothing changed. What am I doing wrong? Well, we've got a lot of your questions coming up and hopefully some answers. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Washington and Jerusalem are looking forward to one of the president's most important foreign policy decisions, whether to move the embassy of the United States from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. At the Saban Forum Sunday, Trump's personal envoy to the Middle East peace process, Jared Kushner, said the president is still undecided. The president's going to make his decision and... Uh, and um, with he hasn't the, made his decision. Uh, he's still uh, looking at a lot of different facts and that mm -hmm. when he makes his decision, uh, he'll be the one to want to tell you, not me. So uh, so he'll, he'll he'll make sure he does that at the right time. The president is expected to make an announcement Wednesday. He could decide to move the embassy to Jerusalem or recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. A special guest paid a visit to CBN in Africa. U.S. Congressman Glenn G.T. Thompson visited CBN in Senegal. Congressman Thompson represents Pennsylvania's 5th District in the U.S. House of Representatives. He traveled around the country for six days to, CB to see CBN's humanitarian projects. CBN also introduced him to Senegal's American ambassador, several government officials, and national church leaders. He also spent a lot of time fellowshipping with CBN's French Africa staff. You can find out more what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. We'll be back with much more of today's 700 Club right after this. Well, it's time for your questions and some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Joy, who says, Hi there. I did the salvation prayer. I invited God into my heart, but nothing changed. What am I doing wrong? Uh, Joy, it's like saying, well, I got married and we bought a new house, and I want, I'm not happy. What's wrong? Well, have you really lived in the house and enjoyed? Do you and your spouse uh, have a real good time? Are you enjoying one another? Have you gotten to know each other? Well, I think that's uh, uh, the answer to you. Uh, enjoy what's yours. You have claimed it. You have, have, have bought the house. You've gotten married in a sense. Now uh, enter into the relationship that you've had. You say, what did you expect to happen? An angel to come down from heaven and with a bolt of lightning and they'll suddenly make you a new... Well, if anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. Well, start enjoying it. All right, what do you got? Well, here's one, Pat, from Jay, who says, What do you do when God has never answered a prayer for you in 64 years? I really need some prayers answered for my grandson and daughter. God knows that it's such a simple, easy prayer, but yet he does nothing. He has done nothing for me in my whole life. I'm starting to feel that God does not exist. Wow. He's never done anything. You're alive, aren't you? How, how old did you say? 64. 64. Well, you've been alive that long, and you apparently are healthy, so yeah. he's done something for you. He lets you live in a, in a free land. You've got freedom to do what you want to do. Uh, you, you obviously have a, a good income. You're living uh, pretty well, and the Lord has done a lot for you. You just haven't recognized it. I think it's time you open your eyes to see who God is and what he is, and you're not having an answer to prayer, but why not? Well, do you have resentment in your heart? Are hey, you, you holding a grudge against anybody? If you do, you won't get your prayers answered. The other thing is, do you know how to pray? 
a lot of times we, we, it's always asking, 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 give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And you're not praising the Lord. You know, you pray with thanksgiving. You thank him for what he's done. You show gratitude. You obviously don't show gratitude for all of the many things that God's done for you. So start thanking him and watch what happens. All right. Okay, this is Janet who says, I'm going through a serious health issue currently. A CT scan detected masses in my lung, breast, ovary, and lymph nodes. The scan report described it as stage four cancer. I've talked with the assistant pastor at my church concerning healing, and she's told me it's my claim to it that's bringing it about. Yet, with renewed faith that God is going to stop it, the cancer has worsened. Is she acting responsibly by telling me that the cancer would not be there if I didn't acknowledge it? Uh, I think that's not exactly the way you look at it. Of course the cancer is there. You've got to be realistic as to what you have a, a medical condition that is life-threatening. So what do you do? Well, you begin to come to the Lord and you begin to rebuke that situation and you speak words of faith. That my, I'm, I am getting better. I'm going to be healed. But that doesn't mean that you are not acknowledging what's there. Um, you know, I, I don't know in things like this. There comes a time that you have to acknowledge that uh, death is coming on you and you need to get ready for it. I, I don't know what to tell you because I don't know you well, but I wouldn't blame an assistant pastor uh, for saying what she said, because that, that really isn't accurate. All right. Okay, this is Kieran, who says, I'm a student, and I've been recently laid off from my part-time job. I've been searching for employment for the last few months, but with Christmas right around the corner and with money getting tight, I'm really starting to worry. What should I do? Well, you know, what you have to do is ask yourself, how can I make a difference in an employer's life? What is it they need that I can bring to them? You know, we're always saying, well, will you give me a job? Will you give me money? Will you pay me a salary? Well, what can you do for the employer? And I think that's what you need to say. I've got these skills, and here's where I can help your business. And here's a plan to make you sell more goods at Christmas time. And, you know, people are looking for, for workers. I mean, there is a tremendous shortage of workers right now uh, to handle all the packages and all the stuff that's going out. So I, I, it shouldn't be too hard. Look for somebody who has a need, shorthanded, and you're there to supply that need. I mean, always look for the, how you can meet somebody's need, not how can they meet your need, all right? This is a viewer who says the Bible says that Jesus often cast out demons from many people. I'm sure that many people today are possessed by demons. How would one know if he is possessed and how would he cast the demon out? Well, you cast the demons out by speaking in the name of Jesus, but uh, we've got to be very careful of these people that are out, you know, demon hunting. And the Bible says if you uh, pursue evil, evil will come to you. Uh, I, I'm just very leery of, of, of these people who are always casting out demons. Uh, demons are real. They were real in Jesus' day. They're real today. But how do you know? I, well, it's discernment. And, and how do you have discernment? Well, it's by practicing the presence of God and by dealing with these things over a period of time. But you have to be very careful that you're not attributing a your mother-in-law is a little unpleasant, so you think she's got a demon. That's not a good way to go. You know what I'm saying? All right. <laughs> Though it may be prevalent. <laughs> Maybe. All right. Okay. All right. That's all the time well, we have for all now. Right. Well, Tim Ray is a hardworking truck driver. When he's not on the road, he's spending time with his wife, uh, Vicki, and their four children. And like many families, they've had their share of financial setbacks. And for a while, they even had to live in a tent. Watch this. Tim and Vicki Ray and their four children enjoy every moment of family time they can. We love going to the park. We like playing sports together. We get out and then we have a lot of fun. Tim works long hours driving an 18-wheeler. I love my husband a lot, and I'm thankful for that man every day. You know, he's a hard worker. Never met a man that was so determined to work and make sure he could support his family. When Tim's hours at work were drastically cut, the family ran out of options, and for a while, the only place they had to live was a small camping tent. It can be tough times, and you don't know what you're going to do. We just have to look forward and, 
and keep going on. With each struggle, the Rays have leaned on God. I've learned that you can't look at the down, you have to look at the up in life when you're like on the down times. There's times that we don't know when we're going to have money to wash clothes. We've had to sit down and either pay a bill or eat. The Ray family says they experienced God's provision through Operation Blessing partner, Joseph Storehouse. Seeing the wheelbarrows come out the door to the car and seeing how much food that they give is just like, wow. I mean, that's like way more than you can get into a little shopping cart. It was really a blessing, and, and my kids, their eyes were just like, oh my gosh. Operation Blessing at Joseph Storehouse has helped us out a ton. When you don't have to worry about some groceries a month, that little bit, and that makes a huge difference. It helps. People that are able to donate and give to Operation Blessing and Joseph Storehouse, I think it is an amazing thing that you're doing that because what you're doing, are, you're not just giving, you're showing them the love of God through your gift to them. You know, it's one of our joys to be able to feed people, to clothe people. The Lord gave me Isaiah 58 some years ago. This is what you, the fast I've chosen, that uh, you would deal your bread to the hungry. If you see the naked, you'd clothe him. That if there's somebody suffering, that you would bring the, the, the joy of the Lord to them. And Operation Blessing has now... Uh, well, we, we've helped uh, millions of people and given away about $4 billion worth of stuff, uh, food, clothing, housing. It's what you can do when you, you know, when you join the 700 Club. We want to give you this, by the way. It's called Ask Anything. It's some questions that we've had, and we've got another one coming up, I, I might add, that's answers to prayer that uh, we'll give away. Uh, I will tell you about in January. But th this is available for you right now. It's biblical answers to life's most pressing questions. And uh, it's yours when you join the 700 Club. And how do you do that? 65 cents a day, you can bring joy to somebody, especially this Christmas time. Let's help each other. Terry? I have a, a comment yeah, I'd like to share with you. I know this will bless you. But this is Julio, who lives in Newport News, Virginia, who has listened to Ask Anything and is saying, I was very impressed with the strong God-anointed answers in Ask Anything. My wife, Grace, and I are very blessed with your spirit-filled wi wisdom and teachings. You have encouraged us. And that's the whole point of that gift for that's all right. of our partners, isn't it? To just well, encourage you in your faith. To so. get the word. And, and we're here. I believe the Bible. You know, I believe. I really believe the Bible. And I really believe in God. And I know He's real. And uh, if I can bring to you the joy of the Lord, then that, that's my delight. Mm -hmm. And I've answered some questions that were really hard questions, and that's what this uh, DVD is about. And the one that's coming up is going to be dynamite. I mean, I was there with Scott Ross, and we we're talking about uh, answers to prayer and hindrances to prayer. And and, and examples of answered prayer and some of these wonderful things. Okay, Terry, you've got a guest. Tell me about it. Well, speaking of, of answers to difficult right. questions, we've got an author, speaker, and mother of four grown children. Job concerns, rocky relationships, addictions, there are temptations and pressures that clamor for our kids' attention. Jody Burnt shows you how to pray for your adult children after this. How old our children grow as parents, we never stop worrying about them. And we should never stop praying for them either. Take a look. Jody Burnt, author, speaker, and mother of four grown children, believes that the key component to successful parenting is prayer. If you've got adult children, you know there's a whole lot more to the mix. Job concerns rocky relationships, addictions. There are temptations and pressures that clamor for our kids' attention, but offer only counterfeit joy. In her book, Praying the Scriptures for Your Adult Children, Jody shows us how to pray for them, whether they're just leaving the nest or flying on their own. Well, we welcome back to the 700 Club our dear friend Jody Burnt. It's great to have you back. Thank you, Terry. It's so great to be here. You have written two books prior to Praying the Scriptures for Your Adult Children, and 
all of them are about praying the scriptures for our kids. It's, I mean, it's such a huge responsibility. <laughs> Why is it so powerful to pray the scriptures? Oh, what a great question to kick off with. It is because we are taking the very words of God, the words He yeah. first breathed into our life, mm -hmm. and then praying them back to Him. Yeah. And they come with power and they come with authority. And they're a lot more interesting, I'll tell you, than praying the prayers I would make up on my own. What, you know, a lot of people might say, well, well, what do you mean praying for our adult children? By that time we've launched yeah, them. The they've baked, yeah. all that, but, right. But I got this right away. <laughs> I went, oh, sign me <laughs> yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, the, a parent's job is never over, you even when your children are grown. never being a parent. You yeah. And you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this book, apart from the fact that I now have four adult <laughs> children and I needed it and need to pray, is that I want to let parents know they're not alone. Yes. You know, we think, okay, we're not on the sidelines of the sporting team with all of our friends and yeah. anymore, and we feel like our, our nests are empty, and our lives are sometimes a little bit empty of some of those yeah. friendships with other parents. Mm -hmm. And yet, I just want people to know we're all in this together. Yeah. God sees exactly where we are. My needs might not match your needs for your children, and yet we can all be praying, yeah. and God's Word is still alive and will accomplish its purposes. How do we pray for adult children? Is it different than praying for our kids when they're well, younger? Well, people say, you know, little people, little problems, big people, big problems, and that's a fair assessment. But in reality, all of our kids, whether they're yeah. four years old or 40 years old, they need wisdom. They need yeah. God's guidance. They need His joy. They need His grace. They need all of those things. Okay. Um, obviously, in this book, the issues are about getting a job, finding a marriage partner, and some tricky stuff like mental health issues or addictions or prodigal kids, you know, yes. some of that. So the issues may change, but God doesn't. What Talk a little bit about some of the issues that you address in the book, because you haven't shied away from things that are very difficult, not just for the child going through them, but for the parent yes. feeling, what can I do? Yes. Because now they're grown up. They make yeah. their own decisions. They do. Um, and I do. I talk about those common issues. All of our kids need God's health and protection. They all need to get a job, and most of them are, or as parents, we might be praying about their marriage partner. But then, as I say, I also do talk about um, sexual sin or uh, drug and alcohol addiction, uh, questions about faith, walking away from maybe what they were raised. So, so it kind of runs the gamut there, but I, I just wanted parents to know um, God sees us. He knows where we are and what our needs are. And some of the things that you just mentioned, I think one of the questions Christian parents have is, how do I love my child through oh, this gosh. difficult place without yeah. condoning yeah. their behavior? That's a, that's a great question because I talk to a lot of parents who are like, God, what the heck? You know, I don't yeah. know what's going on and how can I love my child? Um, I would say praying for them is a gift we give all of our children. But the other thing we can do, and a lot of parents don't do this, is bless our children. Mm. Because a blessing is not the same thing as an endorsement. Yes. When we bless our kids, we speak God's favor over them. Yes. We invite His presence into their lives. You know, we can say, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make His face shine upon it. you. And mean <laughs> it, and absolutely mean it. So we really can bless them, even if we don't agree with or approve of all the choices they make. One of your children is a rocket scientist. <laughs> I mean, yes. really? Wow. Yeah. yeah, that was not my doing. I was an English major. I considered that her rebellion. Um, yeah. But share how you've prayed through the scriptures in a way that has impacted your own children. Well, in that case, you know, she was looking for a job and um, she just wanted to work in the space industry. Yeah. And I kept saying, you know, aim lower. Like yes. that's, and, and yet God, God kept- Way to go, mom. Yeah, I know, not my best parenting speech. But it was really what God had put on her heart. And so my job as a parent was to come alongside her, to believe that Ephesians yes. 2, that there are good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do. And that what Psalm 139, how he's formed her fearfully and wonderfully yes. and in ways I didn't understand, but he did, to be able to come alongside that in her job hunt and pray God's favor and that he would open those doors yeah. for her to really live out her dream. And you saw that. We saw it. You Thanks saw be that to God. Happen. Yeah. <laughs> Adult children make choices that break the hearts of their parents. What do you say to the parent who has a prodigal, yeah. dearly loved? Yeah. They've done everything they know how to do and they're just far away. Yeah, um, and I have a lot of friends in that boat. And I would say God knows, mm -hmm. God sees, God um, has had his own children walk away. He knows what it's like to be the parent of a wayward child. And he is pursuing that child every bit as much as you are. Um, and I know I was praying some things for my children 
that didn't happen. And I thought, God, come on. I've asked you this. I've prayed the scriptures. We've, you know, worked. Yes. And, he, and I said, I trusted you. And God said, Jody, you didn't trust me. You trusted in an outcome. Yes. And I wow. have a different plan. Mm -hmm. I want you to trust me. I'm still writing their stories. So for parents who are going through that hard and rocky season, I would say, trust God. Yeah. He's still writing your child's story. Oh, dear ones, it's all in here. You don't <laughs> want to miss this. Praying the scriptures for your adult children available wherever books are sold. We also have a social exclusive interview with Jody on our Facebook page. Just go to facebook.com slash 700 club. Thank you. You're always rich with wisdom. Oh, Terry, thank you. Uh -huh. Pat? Thanks, uh, Terry. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Proverbs. Quote, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You can count on that one. Well, tomorrow, more deadly news on sugar addiction. And we're not just talking about sweets. They're everywhere, and I think uh, this will be our health tip for Christmas. Probably ruin your Christmas and tell you not to eat all that uh, pie and cake that's coming down. But anyhow, you'll hear it on the 700 Club. Well, thanks so much for being with us. That's all the time we've got. And for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.